Section four of the Age of the Condottieri by Oscar Browning. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two Joanna of Naples, Muzzo Sforza, Braccio da Montone, and Carmagnola. Part two. The soldiers of Sforza determined to avenge the death of their chief. Like the black bronze vicars, they placed themselves in mourning darkening their helmets and decking their chargers with black housings the battle was fought under the walls of aquila on june second fourteen twenty four it lasted eight hours and no prisoners were made on either side braccio was defeated and fell wounded in the head he was carried into the city and died there refusing all food and the aid of doctors he was in character far inferior to sforza he knew neither pity nor religion, nor had he any affection except for his comrades in arms. A chronicler says of him, In his army he was loyal and valiant, but he was impious and heretical in his life. He believed neither in God nor the saints. He despised the offices and services of the church, never heard mass, and was most cruel. By the desire of the Pope, his body was carried to Rome and buried in unconsecrated ground. The principality which he had formed was broken up. Filippo Maria Visconti, the second son of John Galeazzo, succeeded his brother John Maria in 1412. He was naturally of weak health, and whether at table, in bed, or on the chase, surrounded himself with doctors. In his early youth he delighted in the arts of war, but with advancing years he became stout and sickly and had to content himself with hunting. He was a master of dissimulation. At the same time he was no despiser of literature and studied the poems of Petrarch and Dante and the histories of Livy. He could not bear to be alone, and sometimes summoned his guards to watch round his bed as he often passed sleepless nights. He was reputed religious and charitable, but he was very superstitious and believed in augurs and astrologers. He undertook no military enterprise without consulting the stars, and it is said that the signs of heaven foretold his death three years before it happened. His power depended upon his army, and the efficiency of his army depended upon the excellence of the condottieri leaders whom he was able to attract to his service. The chief among these were Francesco da Caramagnola, Niccolo Piccinino, Francesco Sforza, and Angelo della Pergola. Francesco Busone was born at Carmagnola in Piedmont about the year 1390, and according to the usage of those days took the name of his native town. He became by degrees not only the head of Visconti's army, but the prime minister of his dominions. By the help of this general, and by a combination of courage and duplicity, Filippo Maria gradually recovered most of the possessions which his father had held in northern Italy. One of Carmagnola's first enterprises was to capture the castle of Terezzo, whose ruins now rise majestically from the green waters of the rushing Ada, which was then held by the family of Colioni. Bartolomeo, the last and the best of the condottieri, being then a boy of sixteen. The castle surrendered in the early days of 1417. In 1424, Visconti became master of Genoa by treachery, and in the following year he made an attack upon the Italian provinces of Switzerland. Up to the year 1422, he had made no attempt to recover the former possessions of his house in Tuscany, and the Florentines had no reason to doubt his honor or his good will. But war between these powers broke out in consequence of a dispute about the little town of Forli in the Romagna. Giorgio de Liordelafi died in January 1422, leaving a son, Tebaldo, nine years old. His mother was Lucrezia, daughter of Ludovico Alidosi, lord of Imola. He desired to make himself guardian of his grandson, but the people of Forli, jealous of the supremacy of Imola, determined to give themselves to the church. 
filippo maria seized the opportunity of meddling in the business on pretence of supporting the wife of the deceased duke the people called two milanese condottieri to their aid great was the agitation in florence giovanni de medici tried to prevent the republic from taking part in a quarrel from which they could gain nothing but the war party eventually prevailed and a florentine army was sent to the assistance of the duchess in a few months the florentines suffered no less than six defeats between september fourteen twenty three and october fourteen twenty five they were beaten at ponte aronco zagonara at val di la mona at rapallo at anghiari at la fagula in their trouble they turned to venice for assistance and their prayer for vengeance against the duke was reinforced from an unexpected quarter francesco carmagnola had been living for some time in a kind of exile at treviso in august fourteen twenty five he discovered that filippo maria had formed a plot to poison him he flew to venice spoke against the visconti and entered upon negotiations with amadeo duke of savoy the doge of venice was at this time one of the most distinguished of the line francesco foscari his predecessor tommaso mocenigo who had died on april fourth fourteen twenty three at the age of eighty had warned the republic against him as a restless and unquiet spirit the ambassadors of filippo maria and of the florentines were both at the court of the rialto at the close of fourteen twenty five to the duke the venetians offered their mediation between himself and the florentines but a month later they accepted the alliance with florence the doge urging them to declare war to avenge the injuries they had suffered and to tread underfoot the common enemy of all and to give lasting rest to the whole of italy by the terms of the alliance which was solemnly published on january twenty seventh fourteen twenty six it was arranged that venice was to have the conduct of the war that the conquests made in lombardy were to go to venice and those in tuscany to florence and also those in the marches so far as they did not interfere with the supremacy of the church carmagnola was made commander-in-chief the first operations of carmagnola were directed against brescia which fell into his hands in march fourteen twenty five in july the duke of savoy joined the league on the condition that the city of milan if conquered was to pass to him but the task of the allies was by no means an easy one the war with the turks was still proceeding and negropont was threatened genoa prepared a large fleet to help her suzerain the duke of milan germany and hungary were hostile filippo maria sold forli and imola to the pope to provide himself with money the only thing which helped the allies was the misunderstanding which prevailed amongst the mercenary generals of the duke at last on december thirtieth fourteen twenty six before a single important battle had been lost or won peace was made at ferrara by the intervention of pope martin v brescia with all its dependencies was to remain in the hands of the venetians when the news of the peace reached milan there was an outburst of patriotic fury we are accustomed to regard the government of these italian princes as purely personal and to view them as making peace or war solely by their own interest and advantage here we see the people and the nobles coming forward in a time of peril to rally round their sovereign the emperor sigismund also put pressure upon the duke to break the treaty which he had just ratified and refused to confirm the venetians in the possession of brescia by the exertions of the milanese nobility and the influence of the emperor the war was renewed but the result was only to give a more complete victory to carmagnola at the battle of maclodio fought on october twelfth fourteen twenty seven the duke was entirely defeated and a very large number of prisoners were taken amongst whom was carlo malatesta whom filippo maria had placed at the head of his army in order to appease the quarrels between his condottieri generals a scene followed the battle which throws a curious light on the manners of the time the duke's troops consisted almost entirely of mercenaries 
they had no ill feeling toward the soldiers against whom they had to fight nor the prisoners whom they had taken the consequence was that all the prisoners on both sides were liberated during the night or in the course of the next day this was a common but not universal practice one reason for it was undoubtedly the desire among the professional soldiers that the state of war should continue and that they should not on the conclusion of a lasting peace be sacrificed to the vengeance of the people after this battle amadeo the eighth duke of savoy with the characteristic fickleness of his house made peace with filippo maria at turin on december second whereas he had sent him letters of defiance on august twenty seventh thus savoy and milan were united under the protection of the emperor against venice and florence the duke of milan was to marry maria the daughter of the duke of savoy and to receive the town of vercelli as her dowry the second wife of filippo maria was the unfortunate beatrice di tenda the widow of facino cane the duke had married her from motives of policy but at first loved her dearly and gave her the city of monza he afterwards tired of her and she was executed in august fourteen eighteen on a false charge of adultery protesting her innocence he married maria of savoy on october sixth fourteen twenty eight before this peace had been signed at ferrara on april nineteenth between the combatants again by mediation of the pope the conditions were that brescia together with the conquests made in the district of cremona were to go to venice that bergamo should be surrendered to the same government that the possessions of carmagnola in the milanese should be restored to him but without the right of alienation and that the duke of milan was to form no new alliances in romagna or in tuscany the peace did not last long francesco sforza who had after a breach again entered the service of the visconti recommended a renewal of the struggle the florentines had declared war against paolo giunigi the lord of lucca filippo maria was bound by the treaty of ferrara not to interfere in the affairs of tuscany he contrived however by means of sforza and piccinino actually to give assistance to lucca and to harass the allies of florence he amused the venetians and florentines with negotiations and sent continual messages to the emperor sigismund urging him to march upon italy promising that when he came he would declare himself against the two republics both parties were suing for the support of francesco sforza the duke succeeded in securing him by offering him the hand of his illegitimate daughter bianca maria born in fourteen twenty five and now therefore only five years old the death of the pope martin v and the succession of a venetian gabriel candolmier under the title of eugenius the fourth made no difference in the course of events war broke out openly in the spring of fourteen thirty one a few days after the commencement of the war on march sixteenth the venetians were defeated at soncino and on june twenty second their fleet under niccolo trevisani was utterly routed by the fleet of the visconti under oistaccio pecino it was engaged in the siege of cremona on the side of the river po while carmagnola invested the city by land carmagnola gave no assistance to the venetian fleet but whether this was due to deliberate treachery or to his being deceived by false information cannot be ascertained at any rate his conduct on this occasion formed one of the principal grounds of his impeachment carmagnola also failed to support an attack made upon cremona on october eighteenth when the venetians had occupied the castle of santa luca and one corner of the city walls the cremonese certainly thought that they owed their salvation to his negligence at the beginning of the following year the venetians began to be still more suspicious of their general messengers sent by visconti were continually coming to his camp and on february twenty second fourteen thirty two the venetian senate was compelled to tell him not to trust any ambassadors of the visconti who only meant to deceive it was known that carmagnola desired a principality for himself 
and the venetian government probably believed that visconti's messengers were talking to him of other matters than peace at length on march twenty ninth the council of ten met to deliberate on the fate of the commander-in-chief some were in favour of arresting him openly others of employing artifice the latter prevailed a special messenger giovanni d'imperio was sent to carmagnola who was then at brescia with orders to invite him to come to venice to consult upon the spring campaign which was just about to open if he refused the governors of brescia were to seize him and imprison him in the castle carmagnola accepted the invitation at once at padua he was treated with distinguished honour probably with the view of lulling his suspicions and preventing his escape he arrived at venice on april seventh he was received by the doge with apparent affection but his suite was not allowed to follow him on entering the doge's palace he was conducted to a prison and said with a sigh i clearly perceive that i am dead on april eleventh his chancellor was examined under torture carmagnola himself was not exposed to the rack because one of his arms had been severely wounded but fire was applied to his feet the trial was interrupted during the holy season of easter but afterwards the judges applied themselves to the inquiry day and night at length on may fifth the matter was referred to the council of ten his guilt was soon agreed upon and the only question was as to his punishment a minority were in favour of confining him in a strong castle but the majority voted that on that very day at the accustomed hour and in the usual manner he should be led with a gag in his mouth and his hands tied behind his back to the space between the two columns in the square of st mark and there beheaded his wife who lived at treviso was to have a pension and provision was also made for his daughters the execution was carried out on march fifth fourteen thirty two after sunset materials do not exist for determining the guilt or innocence of carmagnola we know however that the judgment of the council of ten was not given without careful inquiry and long deliberation if they had wished to assassinate him they could easily have done so it is probable that they had proofs of his treachery the desire of every prudent condottiere of those days must have been to carve out a little government for himself as a retirement for his old age and the pursuit of this end was not always consistent with chivalrous loyalty to any master whom at the time he happened to be serving these professional warriors of no country and of no principles served only for pay and could always be bought by a higher bidder the impeachment of colione is a pendant to the execution of carmagnola after this tragedy peace was not long in following and a new treaty the third was concluded at ferrara on april seventh fourteen thirty two it was framed on the basis of the statu quo the duke of milan engaged to surrender his conquests and not to meddle any more in the affairs of tuscany or the romagna End of section four